Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Trent University. I'm Mark Skinner, the Dean of Social Sciences and Humanities. Before we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that Trent University is located on the treaty and traditional territory of the Michisage and Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude to the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. It is important that today, January 27th, is International Holocaust Memorial Day, a day to honor the memory and remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust that occurred during the Second World War. These are trying times in terms of global social justice issues for many communities around the world, particularly in terms of ethnic and race-based oppressions. Today is an important and profound reminder of our need to speak out on issues of social injustice. With this in mind, I'm so pleased to welcome you to the inaugural Kennedy Lecture in Global Social Issues. While we would normally be gathered in person for an event such as this, it's wonderful that we've been able to come today together in a virtual way. At Trent University, we endeavor to be a strong partner in both Pebro and Durham and across Canada and internationally. And sharing knowledge is just one of the ways we do this. The Kennedy Lecture on Global Social Issues is Trent's newest endowed lecture and the first connected with our Department of Sociology. This lecture is only possible due to the generosity of alumnus Bruce Kennedy, who completed a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology at Trent, a Master of Arts in Sociology at Carleton University, and his Master of Public Administration at Harvard University. Bruce was a founding member of Amnesty International's national presence in Canada. As a result, he was recruited to teach English in a rural secondary school in Thailand for two years. Following this initial start, Mr. Kennedy was recruited to a field director position with Plan International, where he focused on pre-primary and adult literacy education and nutrition in Haiti and Sudan. In the early 1980s, Mr. Kennedy joined UNICEF as its services were expanding in Africa. He worked in various capacities in Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sierra Leone, Somalia, and Madagascar, before moving to Fiji to organize support to 13 Pacific Island countries. Since his retirement, Mr. Kennedy has lived in Thailand and continues to promote basic education and social justice and intercult intercultural understanding. He has regularly given back to his alma mater. He was Trent's third alumnus in residence in 2005 and his generous donation will enhance the profile of Trent's notable sociology program. I had the pleasure of meeting Mr. Kennedy last year when he got in touch about continuing his philanthropic interest in creating something special at Trent. And while he can't be with us tonight or this afternoon or whatever time it is around the world where you are watching this, we have a short video greeting from Mr. Kennedy to share with you now. Thank you for inviting me to address this first of the Kennedy series of annual lectures on the social justice issues of our time. When I entered Trent in 1966, it was in its third year of operations. The founder, Tom Simons, was trying to create something very special. We called it a kind of Oxbridge on the autonomy. We had to wear green gowns to our, our tutorials and seminars and even into the dining hall. That kind of tradition didn't last very long. But what he did succeed in doing was creating an intimate community of scholars, which was exactly what I needed at that time. So I'm very pleased to have this opportunity thanks to a generous uh, inheritance, to be able to sponsor this series of annual lectures as my form of giving back to my beloved uh, alma mater, which did so much to encourage my early intellectual development. I'm very happy that this first lecture by Professor Yode will address the issue of the COVID-19. Arguably, this pandemic has had more impact on our way of thinking and behavior than anything comparable since the Second World War. 
mainly in accelerating the acceptance of a number of new technologies which threaten to disrupt and fundamentally transform our modern way of life. I'm sorry I wouldn't be there to participate with you either personally or even virtually. It's now 3 a.m. in Thailand, which has been my home for the past 22 years. However, I look forward to receiving a video recording of your proceedings, and I do earnestly hope that the new insights and knowledge that you will share today will help to keep you safe and empower you to make the most of the new opportunities arising out of this emergent, brave new world. I'm sure you will all join me in expressing our gratitude to Mr. Bruce Kennedy for the impact of his esteemed career and his generosity in many ways to Trent. It's now my pleasure to pass the virtual mic over to Dr. Momin Rahman, Chair of the Department of Sociology. He will give a bit of a rundown of how today's event will run and will introduce our guest of honour. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, and I want to first of all add our thanks from the Department of Sociology to Bruce Kennedy, the generous donor for these series of lectures. I'm just going to give us some housekeeping information to help us uh, make the afternoon go smoothly. Um, and then after that, I'll introduce our guest speaker. So first of all, um, you can use the chat function to connect with fellow attendees. Um, we're always interested to know where you're logging in from, and particularly if you're a Trent alum, we'd love to know that. And so please put that into the chat and it's being monitored. We'll also have some time for a Q&A at the end of the talk today, today this afternoon. So please um, use the Q&A feature at the bottom center of your Zoom window to submit questions. So we'll be monitoring that as well, and we will um, sort through the questions and we'll get to as many as we can. And that will happen after the end of the conversation with Professor Yude. The software we have also auto generates closed captions. If you'd like to turn them on, click on the CC closed captioning button that's also along the bottom of your Zoom window. And finally, we are recording the lecture. Um, and so that's to let you know that it will be recorded. Um, and afterwards, it will be posted to our website and that will be found at trentu.ca slash Kennedy. And with that housekeeping done, I want to move to um, introducing our guest speaker. It's a real pleasure for us at Trent and in sociology to welcome Dr. Jeremy Yude as our inaugural Kennedy lecturer. Dr. Yude is a professor of politics and currently the Dean of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota Duluth in the States. He's an internationally recognized expert on global health politics, beginning with work on HIV and AIDS in Southern Africa and expanding out to global health governance and politics more broadly. He's the author of five books, co-editor of three volumes, and the author of more than 40 peer reviewed journal articles and book chapters. Most recently and most pertinently, he published Globalization and Health in 2019, and I have a copy in my hands right here, and this book included a long discussion of the challenges that pandemics present in our interconnected world. So although we have to do this virtually, I hope you can all join me in welcoming Jeremy Yude to be our inaugural Kennedy lecturer. So welcome, Jeremy. Nice to see you. Um, nice you. And uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to have a kind of Q&A with Jeremy, in fact, a conversation between me and Professor Yu. Um, and then we'll be walking through the four lessons from the middle of the pandemic that the talk is titled for. Um, but to begin, I'm gonna give um, Jeremy some time to provide us with a brief overview and introduction to the subject. So Jeremy, I will hand over to you. 
Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who is here. My thanks to Trent University and to the Department of Sociology for this invitation and to Mr. Kennedy for his generosity that has allowed this lecture series to happen. I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you in person, but obviously international travel is not really a thing right now for a number of reasons. Um, so I am speaking to you from the University of Minnesota Duluth. And I did wanna take a moment to acknowledge that the, the University of Minnesota Duluth is located on the traditional ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on land that was cared for and called home by the Ojibwe people, before them the Dakota and the Northern Cheyenne people, and other native peoples from time immemorial. Seated by the Ojibwe in an 1854 treaty, this land holds great historical, spiritual, and personal significance for its original stewards, uh, the native nations and peoples of this region. I recognize and continually support and advocate for the sovereignty of the native nations in this territory and beyond. By offering this land acknowledgement, I affirm tribal sovereignty and will work to hold the University of Minnesota Duluth accountable to American Indian peoples and nations. So, you know, as, as Moen mentioned, you know, I'm coming to this topic around the COVID-19 pandemic as a political scientist and as a Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. And to, to be frank, when we're talking about the, these topics, political science is not the first thing that comes to mind. The liberal arts are not the first area that, 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 that you tend to think of. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those situations in which people sometimes ask, well, where are you coming into this? Why, why do you and your perspective matter? And, you know, if you want to know the specifics of the various COVID vaccines or things along those lines, you know, I am not your guy. Like I, the last biology course I took was during the early part of the Clinton presidency. This is not what, this is not where, I, where I'm coming into this. But as Moman mentioned, my area of research focuses largely on global health politics and the international responses to infectious disease outbreaks and how the international system fosters or hinders cooperation. Um, in trying to address these sorts of cross-border issues. And so if we think about politics as power, thinking about pandemic responses is ultimately about all these different expressions of powers that governments make, the ways that they, they have chosen or chosen not to engage in various topics. And more broadly, when we're looking at issues of public health, we have to realize that public health is inherently political. It's a reflection of our priorities, of our interests, of our values. Now that's not necessarily the same thing as saying that public health is a partisan issue. And when it does become a, an overly partisan issue, that's when we tend to see problems going awry. That's, that's uh, oftentimes a, times a reflection of when these responses become a bit pear-shaped. But it's important to understand that the recommendations that say policymakers get from scientists, from public health officials, get filtered through political systems and political processes. And so we need to understand how those political processes operate in order to know what's possible, what's not possible, and how we might be able to make some sort of change within the system. And that's just looking at the domestic level. When we're talking about this on the international level, things get even more complicated because we don't have the same sorts of government structures in place. We don't have the same sorts of hierarchies. People have sometimes talked about international relations as an exercise in cat herding. And pandemic response is oftentimes a really, you know, sadly, a really good example um, of that. So it's more than just looking at looking to Dr. Fauci and seeing what his next proclamation is going to um, is going to be, and then just having that automatically turn into to policy. We've obviously seen here in the United States um, over the past ten uh, or eleven months how the recommendations from from, policy, uh, from scientists and public health officials don't then naturally translate into to uh, direct policies. And so it's, un so it's important to understand the political dimension when we're trying to understand both uh, how we respond and why we respond in certain ways. Um, and before I, uh, we kind of open up the, the conversation, I also want to acknowledge the fact that it can be dangerous to try to analyze an event like this in the midst of it. And, and you know, we don't really know whether we're at the we're near the end, that we're, we're in the middle of the event, or, you know, heaven forbid, we're, we're still at the very beginning of this. Um, that said, it still can be very important and useful to take stock of what we seem to have learned so far, 
it's important to learn the lessons from the past, but not at the same time, not overlearn the lessons from the past or overlearn the, uh, the sorts of, of experiences that we've had. So I don't know that I can necessarily offer you concrete predictions of how everything is going to play out over the next you know, few months or a few years, or tell you exactly what the, what the future holds, but we have seen some successes and some failures at both the domestic and the, the international levels. We can use that as information uh, to guide us going forward. And I'll just put up front, you know, I'm someone who looks at a lot of these, these sorts of issues as, you know, depending on the day, I'm an optimistic pessimist or a pessimistic optimist about what the future holds in terms of the response. But that said, we, we are starting to, to gather some information. We are starting to see some, some trends that are developing. I wanted to uh, spend this time with all of you this afternoon um, talking about, about some of those those trends that, that we've identified. That's great, Jeremy. Thanks for that um, overview. And uh, I think it's also great that, um, you know, to remind people that, you know, we are in the middle of this and we're not sure um, how it's going to play out. Um, but it's nice that, you know, the approach has been, you know, four lessons from the middle of the pandemic, because clearly we're not at the end, um, you know, of this. Um, either in terms of, you know, vaccinations or the, the consequences for us learning about how the global health system works. So that's really the first lesson I wanted to touch base with you on. Um, and, you know, you had said that the global health system, and this is perhaps, you know, relates to your pessimistic optimism or optimistic pessimism, um, that the global health system is kind of doing both worse and better than um, we'd expected or we'd imagined. So I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit on both, you know, what you think is is going um, better than you might have thought, and then also what's doing worse than we thought. Sure, sure. So, you know, when we're looking at these sorts of international responses, we're ultimately looking at a system of what's often known as global health governance. And when we're, and the thing that, that is really, uh, I think, becoming apparent is that, in a lot of respects, this system that we have, this global health governance system that we have is fairly, fairly strong in a lot of respects. But at the same time, what COVID has really brought to the forefront is that the system is based largely on these shared normative commitments. It's based on kind of a common understanding as opposed to formal legal structures or, or other sorts of, of uh, foundations that, that are in place. And also that this system is woefully underfunded for the sorts of expectations that we have placed on, on the system. So when we're thinking about global health governance and th this idea, what we're talking about are these formal and informal institutions and norms that govern how the international system reacts to and manages cross-border challenges to health. So we can think about this in, in a few different ways. And one of the ways is we, uh, we can do it is in terms of thinking about the resources. The, the, the actual finances. If we look over the past, say, 30 years or so, so roughly about a generation in, in time, we have seen a stark increase in the amount of resources going for development assistance for health. Um, at around 1990, we had about $5 billion per year that was going towards development assistance for health. In 2018, we had about $33 billion going towards uh, development assistance for health. And that's those uh, figures are in constant US dollars in, in 2018. So over the, the span of about 30 years, we have seen a, a six-fold increase in the amount of resources that are, are going into the global health governance. And we've also seen a wider array of, of actors getting involved, not just governments, but also intergovernmental organizations, private philanthropies like the, the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. But one of the things that we have seen pretty consistently over this time is that the United States has consistently been one of the most generous uh, countries when it comes to global health financing. Roughly about a third of, of the funding that we've seen over this time period has come from, from the United States. Um, and that has knock-on effects. When a country like the United States shows that it's willing to, to provide the, these funds, other countries are also showing that they are that that this is something that they are willing to invest their funds in, and global health governance uh, and global health has been one of those last remaining areas of of bipartisan agreement, at least within the American political system. Democrats and Republicans have, for the most part, been able to to come to agreement um, on this. 
So we've, we've seen some of that. That, that, that's, that is good. And that's helped to build the foundation that, that we have, have seen in terms of response uh, to, to COVID-19. If we look at it in terms of organizations, you know, we don't have an explicit hierarchy of institutions within global health governance, but the most prominent is the World Health Organization. And this is an organization that has been around since 1948, um, has 194 members. Every single country that is a member of the United Nations is a member of the World Health Organization, unless they specifically opt out. And only one country has done that so far, um, and that is Liechtenstein. Um, couldn't tell you why. Haven't ever been able to figure it out, but um, but they also have membership and associate membership from other self-governing territories. So we have 194 members, almost entirely, uh, you know, almost a near universal membership within this um, within the, this organization, and it has a constitutional mandate to act as an international coordinator for cross-border health concerns. And this is where we start to see some of these issues around funding and around the, the, the power of norms really coming into play. Because the World Health Organization does not have the power to introduce policy itself. It cannot force countries to do anything. Um, you know, we have seen a lot of debate in the, over this past year about the relationship between the World Health Organization and the government of the People's Republic of China. Even if the World Health Organization wanted to, it could not force the Chinese government to take certain actions because we have a system that is still ultimately based on this idea of sovereignty, that national governments have the, uh, have the power and the ability to determine the, the, the rules and regulations within their territories. So it can't force anyone to adopt specific uh, policies, but it does have power because it can act as a convener. It can bring countries together. It can foster the, this sort of, of cooperation. It can act as a disseminator. It can share information that, that it collects from various uh, countries. And it can act as an advocate, bringing attention to, to issues as they arise. And it's doing all of this with a budget for a two-year period of about five billion dollars. And to put that into, into a little bit of, of perspective, Americans spend about that much on alkaline batteries, on the batteries that go into things like your, your remote controls or, or things like that on an annual basis. So the same amount that we are using in order to make sure that we've got batteries to, to ensure that our wireless uh, mice are able to run our computers as we're spending more and more time on Zoom, that's the same amount of money that we're expecting um, the World Health Organization to oversee all of these sorts of global issues. So when you have something like COVID that pops up, this is where the World Health Organization really comes into play. The reason that we, we really know about something like like COVID is because there were reports that, that were shared with the World Health Organization from, uh, from China about the emergence of this, this new disease. So it's a similar sort of thing to what we saw with the emergence of SARS in 2002. You start to get these reports that are filtering up to the World Health Organization, and it has the ability that, to then share that information with other states, with other researchers, and also to bring countries together to think about, you know, how do we respond to something like this? And so this is really the time for an organization like the World Health Organization to shine, to work with governments, to bring countries together, to, to hold the daily press conferences that, that uh, Dr. Tedros, who is the Director General of the World Health Organization has been, been, um, been holding. But because again, so much of the system is based on these normative commitments, and based on, on the, this relatively meager funding that the organization has, when you have an organization like the World Health Organization being thrown into the middle of the political maelstrom, as it has been over the, these, these past 10 months, um, it's hard for an organization like that to maneuver. When the United States says, hey, we don't like how you are operating and we are going to withdraw our membership from the World Health Organization, that has huge uh, effects. That, that has a signaling uh, effect to the rest of the world. And that, that keeps the, the, not only the, the finances in a greater sense of peril, but also then hampers the ability of countries to come together, to work together, to try to figure out some sort of unified response to, um, to, to how we're going to, to deal with these sorts of issues. And so really what COVID shows is that so much of our international uh, work on disease control is built on norms as opposed to these explicit laws, as opposed to, to this idea that we can force countries to do things. Now, 
we've obviously seen, obviously seen a transition in the leadership here in the United States um, in the past few weeks. President Biden, when he was um, uh, when he was campaigning for office, one of, he said that one of his first actions when he assumed the the presidency would be to rejoin the the World Health Organization, and that is something that he did on day one. He signed an executive order to to bring uh, the United States back into to the organization. But it also raises some of the, those questions around ongoing leadership and the the sort of commitment that states have to to these sorts of institutions. So that's kind of the, the pessimistic side of things. On the other hand, we have seen these genuine efforts, even in the absence of the United States being involved, even in, in these questions about global leadership in, in um, health responses, we have seen these ongoing efforts to recognize that an international response is going to be necessary. So we have seen things like the COVAX partnership, trying to, to ensure that there is going to be access for uh, countries in the global south to get access to, to the COVID vaccine. There are all sorts of problems with the, the COVAX system. It is not a perfect system by any stretch of the imagination, but the fact that there is this ongoing willingness to engage in these conversations and to recognize that this is going to be an important element of an effective response actually does provide uh, some measure of of, of hope, essentially, of, of some optimism. We have seen countries being willing to step up their financial contributions, able to try to counteract some of what has happened with the United States uh, temporarily withdrawing some of, of, of its, its funding. We're seeing a system that is showing that it can adapt to the, these changing situations. So that, that's a, that gives us a, some measure of, of hope. But again, the system is only as strong as the members of the system want to make it. And that's what going to be one of the challenges, not just in terms of COVID, but also in terms of thinking about the, the ongoing responses, because this is not the last pandemic. This, we, never, we, we know that we will see future pandemics. We don't know when they'll happen. We don't know where they will start. And we don't know what the disease will be. But we need to have a system that is going to be resilient and able to respond on a, a, you know, when, a, as soon as something comes up like this. So there is definitely some challenges there. But we, what we have seen is that even when there is this questioning of the system, states still show some commitment to it. They, they still show that there is something that, that is there and valuable. And, the, and now the question is, how do we try to adapt that? Rather than trying to create a brand new organization, how do we adapt the sorts of systems that we have to uh, address the, the, the changing sorts of, of issues that are emer emerging within the international system? Yeah, so thanks. And I think um, I really, you know, it really struck me that, you know, you're saying, um, that you know, a lot of these things, these organizations or our ability or our willingness to do something depend on, as you said, norms. And that's, that's a, you know, a concept we use a lot in sociology, but in international politics too. And it really is about um, you know, establishing what's um, a, a kind of expected and decent sort of level of behavior. And it's sometimes frightening, I think, for us to think, um, you know, we, we really have to depend on people believing in the system or believing in the organization to do stuff. And then, you know, it's kind of a shock last year when Trump said, okay, we're going to withdraw um, from this organization in the middle of a pandemic. And you're like, well, right. that's, that's not sensible, but it's like, well, yeah, but actually, you know, the Americans could do that if they wanted to do it. So I think that's a really good lesson for people to take that throughout lots of different aspects of society. It's, it's how the patterns of kind of organization that we've established aren't necessarily laws or regulated. They're just what we think should happen, happens. But also something positive there in terms of even under that stress, enough people and enough governments still believed, okay, we need this organization. And I think it's really interesting to, I didn't know about the um, the, uh, the six-fold increase in funds going towards health. Um, so I, I guess that's an indication that, you know, governments generally have recognized that this is important in terms of development overall, right? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the issues that's come up is um, that, uh, you know, both in terms of North, global North and global South um, and governments and nations ability to cope with um, responses to the pandemic, but also internally within Western countries where um, racialized groups are the minority. Um, and I, I think Biden has talked about this, but lots of other people have talked about dealing with a twin pandemic of racial injustice and COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of your other lessons that COVID isn't, risk isn't equal across all groups. So I just, I think people have an understanding of that in terms of our own societies in Canada, um, 
we've seen a disproportionate lack of services, for example, to um, remote indigenous communities in particular. Um, I know that in Bryn, where my family are based, um, you know, South Asians and um, black people have been disproportionately infected and that's been true in the state. So I wonder if you could just, um, you know, kind of elaborate on that and kind of pass that down for us in terms of, of that risk across different groups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it, it's one of those those statements that has become a bit of a cliche when we're talking about COVID, you know, we're all at risk. That's why we all need to wear masks or engage in social distancing and these sorts of things. And, you know, as you point out, that's not exactly true. We do we we see that there are the, these sorts of racialized differences and social differences that, that exist within societies, and you know, what what I think is is happening here is it's really bringing home the, this concept of the social determinants of health and why the social determinants of health are are so important. Um, so when we're talking about social determinants of health, you know, we're talking about those economic and social conditions that influence an individual's or a group's health outcomes. And COVID is really throwing this into to stark relief because we are seeing these significantly higher case rates and fatality rates among racial and ethnic minority populations here in the US, in Canada, and in almost every single society um, around the world. And that's, and the thing to really uh, keep in mind here is that this is not about some sort of physiological difference. You know, that, that is not what, what the social determinants of, of health are looking at. We're looking at the, these issues around, say, you know, particularly here in the U.S., where we do not have a national health care system. We're looking at issues around who has access to, to health care. We're looking at um, some of the, these economic disparities that exist, about looking at which groups are disproportionately in um, low wage and or essential positions and whether or not they have access to, to the sorts of, um, you know, to the funds to be able to, to, to get uh, health care, but also, you know, I have the luxury of being able to work from home in the midst of, the, uh, of a pandemic. The, the, the people who are at a greater risk don't have that, that same sort of luxury. If you are working at, you know, my partner works in the, the, the grocery industry. He does not have, you know, most of the people in the grocery industry have to be there stocking the shelves or checking out people or, or doing these sorts of things. And they're not making the, the, the same sorts of wages. And again, the, the, the people in these groups have a disproportionate, they are disproportionately people coming from immigrant communities, from racial and ethnic minorities, and from, from people of lower socioeconomic status. And so, and so you know, that, that is the risk factor that, that is here. It really comes down to these issues about race um, and, and class and how those are then filtered through society and what sorts of priorities that, that we make within society about uh, um, uh, around the, these sorts of health issues. But it also means that if we're thinking about trying to improve health outcomes or trying to address the, the effects of the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, that we have to look at this in terms of a big picture. It's not enough just to have a vaccine. It's not enough, enough just to have some sort of, of, of drug um, that is is going to be available because that's not fundamentally going to change things like economic um, and educational opportunities or lack of, of consistent housing or you know, access to sanitation or all of these other sorts of things that, that play into a person's and a group's um, overall health outcomes. And if we don't take that into account, you know, we're, we may be addressing the biomedical side of things, but we're not addressing these underlying conditions. And this is something that, that again, we have seen time and time again through various outbreaks, that, that groups that are disfavored, groups that do not have the same sort of access to power, be it political power, economic power, whatever, however we want to define power, those groups tend to be disproportionately affected by, by what's going on. And so we have to think about any sort of response um, and, and thinking about the, the sort of risk that people are at, not just in terms of the, 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 the biomedical side of things, but also in the, this broader social and economic side of things. And that's a much trickier thing for, for any society uh, to address. And again, when we're talking about this on a global scale, it's, it becomes that much more, more difficult. We have seen that the international uh, system, the, the global community has shown some interest in this, looking at things like the Millennium Development Goals and now the, the Sustainable Development Goals. So there is some, some, some element of, of this, but it's about actually putting those things into practice and being willing to change some of the existing structures that will then play into to these sorts of, uh, of issues. And you know, going back to, to this uh, COVIX, uh, uh, vaccine facility that is trying to, to get access 
for countries in the global south to the vaccine, you know, that's that comes into um, you know that, that that raises these sorts of challenges. Do we want to think about these things in terms of a cosmopolitan sort of response, or do we want to think about them in terms of a of a nationalist sort of response? I think um, it's uh, you know it, I I kind of hope that as people recognize that um, essential workers were more vulnerable and that in many Western countries, they are disproportionately, as you say, from immigrant um, groups. And the pattern is fairly well established. You know, for lots of immigrant groups, um, you know, they enter the socioeconomic labor market, usually lower, um, and then over generations progress up. Um, so, you know, there is some hope that perhaps that awareness is kind of spreading out more um, throughout society. But as you say, we, at some point, are going to you know, we're going to have taxes raised, you know, to pay for all the extra um, funding that's been necessary. And for wealthier countries, it's been easier to borrow that money. Um, but it will be interesting to see if the, you know, that at that point where it's, you know, we need to improve our services, our health services, um, and we need to improve socioeconomic, you know, uh, safety nets and um, economic opportunities. Um, if we can make that connection. And when I say we initially, I'm actually talking about people like, you know, you, um, professors um, and public advocates. Um, but of course, that has to become a more widespread, um, you know, political debate, I think. Uh, but yeah, it's been interesting, um, you know, to see that connection. And as you say, it's not new news, but maybe there's a new um, awareness of that, seeing that, you know, racial injustice is connected to these outcomes. Um, and on the global scale, it's, um, it, there was a report published, I think, uh, a couple of days ago by an international business group saying, you know, if we don't vaccinate um, the global south and, um, you know, poorer countries, that will not save the global north because of the interconnectedness of business and travel. And so, in fact, it is a, you know, a kind of whole of world um, institution or, or problem. Um, but this was an intriguing third lesson that you had, which is which at some point may or in some way may kind of undermine that. So I just wanted to explain this because this uh, you're saying that the cliche about viruses not respecting the borders is maybe not as true as we thought. Um, so are you saying there that, in fact, there are differences in how um, the virus plays out in borders? or Are you talking there about the politics of that country? So please expand on that for us. Yeah, it's, you know, it is more the latter, more about thinking about about the politics of how the these play out, because, you know, we are, there are some potential issues that, that have popped up around the, the variants that, that we're seeing in, in COVID, you know, there's the, the UK variant, there's the Brazil variant, and there's the, the South African variant right now, and there's concern about those. But, you know, on the one hand, yeah, you know, Viruses don't know anything about borders. They, you know, the 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 ease with which people and goods can go across borders um, outside of, of pandemic times is remarkable. You know, when I was living in Australia, I could get from my home in Canberra to Minnesota in less than 24 hours. Um, and you know, in that that amount of time, you know, even if I were were sick with something, that's probably not going to pop up before I manage to to cross the ocean. Um, but you know, we, we can say that borders are these artificial lines on a map and that they don't have an effect, but they obviously do because we do, you know, because we have a system that is based on sovereignty, we see that there are real differences in terms of how countries have responded and those have direct effects. You know, we can look at something like Sweden and Norway. Countries that 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 share a, a land border of about 1,500, 1,600 kilometers. Lots of commonalities between the two countries in terms of their socioeconomic status, their healthcare resources, their political systems. There's a lot of uh, similarities there. But Sweden has had four to five times the incident incident rates um, of COVID than um, Norway has, and about twice the death rate. And that's due to policy responses. That's due to the fact that the Swedish government uh, was pursuing, without saying that they were pursuing uh, herd immunity policy, they were basically pursuing this policy of, of herd immunity. Um, because you know the virus doesn't just stop at the border, but the, the policies that governments make do stop at borders. And so we have to recognize how borders have this, this sort of influence. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't want this to be a sort of story where we say the global north is doing great, the global south is 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 doing poorly. 
there was a report that came out earlier today from the Lowy Institute, which is a think tank based in Sydney, Australia, and they created their own COVID performance index, looking at 98 different countries and ranking them on who, which countries had been the most effective at responding and which had been the least effective. Uh, their, their top performers um, in the, the COVID per, uh, performance index, New Zealand was number one. Makes sense. You know, we've we've all seen and and heard about the the incredible response that that the New Zealand government has put into place. Number two was Vietnam. Number three was Taiwan, and number four was uh, Thailand, where where Mr. Kennedy himself is is living these days. The bottom performers were places like Colombia, uh, Mexico, Brazil, and the United States. Um, uh, out of the, the 98 countries, the United States was was 94th, Brazil was was 98th, uh, Canada in, incidentally was was 61st. And one of the things that that really came clear um, about the, these trends that that they were identifying is that the political system itself doesn't tell us a whole lot. If it's a democratic system, an autocratic system, some sort of mix, that doesn't really help to account for a lot of of the differences. Nor does national wealth in and of it itself. What does seem to matter though is having relatively cohesive populations and more capable institutions. And so in terms of looking at which countries have had the more successful responses so far, it's as much a social issue as it is a medical issue. It's really about, and it goes beyond just the response to, um, to the, this outbreak, it goes to these issues about trust, about the competency of, of institutions, about the competency of government officials, and the willingness of the population to think, yes, that government has my interests at heart. They are looking out for, for me and for my community. And again, that's something that, that, is very, that is very much dependent on the sorts of policy choices that governments are making. And because we have a system that is very much based in this Westphalian notion of sovereignty, that, that governments make the, the, the decisions for what happens in their borders, it's a lot harder to try to think about um, how we can deal with this um, on a, a, a global scale. You know, it really does come, come about trying to, to develop these, these sorts of, of, of shared norms. Um, you know, it, when we're looking at these issues about vaccine access as well, uh, you know, the, the current estimates are that the Global South will get the, the vaccine maybe in 2023. That's not going to, to, to it, that's not really going to, to be effective in terms of stopping this pandemic um, soon, but it also shows that there are these moral and economic consequences to the fact that we have prioritized borders in the, this sort of way. And, the, and when there, there is this uh, prioritizing of a kind of more of a nationalist response and a more of a cosmopolitan response, this has very direct sorts of, of consequences. You know, the pandemic's not really gonna go away until we have the vaccine um, widely available. And what's stopping that in large part is the fact that, that we have these, these sorts of borders. So, yeah, and I think that that's really interesting and you elaborating on that report. Um, and I have to say that, you know, I made assumptions, um, you know, I, I, I was born and raised in the UK. I spent a lot of my life there and we have a national health service, the world's first, you know, national health service from 1948. Um, and I assumed that um, in Britain, there, it would be fine because it's a, it's a fairly centralized system. It's completely widespread. Um, and it's the only thing people in Britain or everybody agrees on, apart from perhaps, you know, the Queen. Um, it's the only thing that everybody agrees on of all political parties. And it's kind of been a disaster there. You know, I have a family member working in a big London hospital. I have a you know, mother who's um, in a very vulnerable um, age group. And it's, it's been a it, it's kind of been shocking how much of a disaster it is. But then what you're saying is, well, in fact, it's not just those um even if you have the institutions the institutions have to work and the polit the politics have to work and that's been the problem you know kind of in britain and of course in the states you know there there is no kind of socialized um system but in fact some areas have done better than others i guess um yeah i, I mean you, if, I'm, if i'm sitting in my living room i can look out of my my window i can see wisconsin the neighboring state from my uh, from my window, and we have seen vastly different responses in Minnesota versus Wisconsin. A lot of that is because of these sorts of, of political choices that, that governments are, are making as this has become, um, a, a become a partisan issue in a lot of respects. Become a politicized issue. I think, you know, here in Canada, I would say, and I think we'll get some comments on this in the Q&A, um, to a large extent, it hasn't become a partisan political issue. Um, and we have different layers of the governments, like the federal governments are working with 
um, provincial governments, and they're, they're from different ends of the political spectrum. But that seems to have been working. But as as we find out more and more, there are there have been severe gaps in terms of you know who we've covered, what resources people have got, and particularly I think um, connecting back to that equal you know the the issue that it's not equal across all groups. I don't think there's been a great recognition that um, you know there are vulnerable populations because of their socioeconomic status, you know, which maps onto our um, racialization in indigenous populations here in a in a difficult way. Um, is I mean I, I guess I want to be a bit geeky here and just say, do you when you drill down into that, do you? It seems fairly obvious that um, it's not just democratic systems that have dealt with this well. And in fact, you know, New Zealand is a democracy has dealt with it well, but the United States is a democracy and has remained a democracy over the last few weeks. Well done, by the way. Um, it was touch and go there for a little bit. Uh, indeed. Um, and, uh, you know, but that, that doesn't seem to protect societies, right? Because the UK is a democracy, it hasn't worked well. Um, but there is some, you know, there's some backlash against um, the way that, um, say, for example, China has controlled it. There's a lot of stories about, well, yes, it's an autocratic regime. Um, like, is do you have any? I know again, we're in the middle of this, but do you have any thoughts about whether that really matters from the evidence that we know? Whether it's because you're kind of suggesting it's it's the institutions and their effectiveness rather than whether it's democratic, not democratic. Yeah, it, you know, it doesn't. It, at this point, it doesn't seem like the the political system in and of itself is going has that big of of, of an effect um, because. You know, if you have flawed institutions, it doesn't really matter if you're if you're a democratic system or an autocratic system. If people don't believe in those 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 institutions, if the institutions can't deliver, that becomes um, a, a a significant problem and and makes things difficult. Um, and you know, there, there's also been in, in some of the the reporting and some of the the analysis that's come out there have there have been some arguments that have been essentially culturally essentialist, saying, well. Of course, Asian states are doing better because there is a greater uh, um, tolerance or, or there's a, a cultural pro proclivity towards um, obedience or towards following the, what, what, um, what, what the, the government is telling you. And it's like, no, these are also countries that have a lot more experience with dealing with infectious disease outbreaks. You also have, you know, Taiwan, the, the, um, which was ranked third on this um, index that the Lowy Institute put together, their vice president up until just recently was an epidemiologist who led the response to SARS. And so you have you had this, this sort of expertise. Um, and and so so you know I think we need to to we want to avoid saying that that it's about culture. We want to, you know, I think it's always valuable to, to make sure that the public has some sort of input into these processes. You know, I'm I'm someone who believes in democracy as a as a general rule of thumb, but we can't just assume that democratic regimes are automatically going to respond better to this. And um, some of the powers that autocratic regimes have may have been, it may look more useful in the immediate terms, but some of the, the, the analysis that's been done has shown that the, you know, those, those strategies don't really last over the long term. Just imposing say a, a lockdown doesn't do much for you unless you use that time to build up your other sorts of systems, to build up the other sorts of, of responses. And that's going to be a potential problem regardless of whether you're an autocratic system, a democratic system, or some sort of hybrid of the two. Great, that's a great response. Thank you. And that really explains a few things. And you're really, you're actually really um, uh, uh, fulfilling Trent's um, kind of slogan or mission, which is to you know, chat, get people to challenge the way that they think. Um, so you're really delivering on it. So thank you for that. My pleasure. Um, and um, your most depressing lesson, I think, um, <laughs> or perhaps we all realize that this is not, this was true, but your final lesson is um, that, you know, having a vaccine won't, won't be enough. And I think, you know, from your discussions about um, particularly kind of, you know, norms and political institutions, um, we can kind of, and the unequal risk, you know, within societies and we can see why that's the case, but I just wondered if, um, again, I kind of was partly hoping that, you know, vaccination would be enough um, and that, you know, we'd finally get to leave our, our homes. Um, but perhaps, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on, you know, so what will be enough or, you know, what is it that's about the vac um, having vaccines that is isn't a solution? Yeah, well, I mean, we, sh we should acknowledge the fact that the fact that we're even talking about vaccines now is an incredible achievement. 
you know, the, the previous record for developing a new vaccine was about four years for, for the mumps uh, vaccine. I fully admit I had no confidence that there was that we would be at, talking about vaccines at this point in, in, in the process. So, you know, we, it, it's very important to, to recognize how just how remarkable a, an achievement this is. But, you know, vaccines only work once they actually get into people. So it's not it's not about having a vaccine. It's about having vaccinations and figuring out th those sorts of systems that are going to get those into to people. And some of this is about political leadership. Some of this is about just understanding the logistics of how you try to to do something like this on a very mass scale in a variety of different different countries. You know, here in the United States, things are not going well in, in the vaccination efforts. You know, the initial. Um, estimate was that by the end of 2020, we would have 20 million people vaccinated. We actually had about 3 million people vaccinated. Um, things are, are moving um, slowly because of, of what had been a lack of, lack of political leadership and some of the logistical challenges. Um, but that's also not unique to the United States. A lot of countries are not doing really well, excuse me, in terms of, of getting this, this um, the vaccine out there into to, to people. And you know, one of the issues around this is that you know, something like global public health is what we would call a weakest link public good. We're only going to be as strong as the place where the, the rollout has been the least robust. So as, so long as the, 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 the vaccine is not available in wide swaths of the population, we're still going to, to, to be, be vulnerable. Even if, if, if we can go out and get vaccinated tomorrow, if all of us who are here on, on this, this call could do that tomorrow, we're still going to need to be wearing our masks. Um, for, for a while because uh, of the fact there is the, this sort of ongoing risk. Um, but the other thing that I think that, that, that the, the vaccine question calls into question is, are, are, are these questions around um, intellectual property rights and how we make sure people get access to these, these sorts of pharmaceutical inter, uh, interventions that are developed? Because there's oftentimes this mismatch between the people who are most in need and the people who have the ability to afford um, the, the drugs themselves. And this, again, goes beyond what we're talking about with, with vaccination. Um, but you know, in many ways, given the fact that, that these vaccines that have been developed have a lot of public money that have been, have been put into them, have a, a strong government component in a lot of these elements, why we aren't making a bigger push to try to make this uh, more publicly available so that, that anyone could, could potentially manufacture these vaccines is a question. You know, we could look back to something like the, the polio vaccine campaigns that were happening in the 1950s and 1960s. And one of the things that Jonas Salk very, uh, very consciously did was to decide not to patent that vaccine so that it would be available for more potential manufacturers. Um, and that allowed for the rollout of the vaccine in a much quicker uh, way and could, could allow it to, to spread um, more rapidly and into more places um, in a shorter time frame. We haven't been, been able or willing to do that. And it calls into question some of the, the, the issues around the power of pharmaceutical companies, the sorts of um, economic incentives that they may have, and the fact that, that you know, a lot of the, these sorts of drug developments have a strong public component to them, but oftentimes are then put in private hands. And there, again, there's that, that mismatch because if we're looking about the social determinants of health and who's going to have access to, to these sorts of things, um, you know, a lot of times the people who are most in need or who can most potentially benefit from these, um, the, these, these drugs or these vaccines won't have access to them. Or outside of COVID, some of the, um, the issues that, that could most benefit from some sort of pharmaceutical in, uh, intervention aren't going to be pursued because there's not seen as a market for them. The people who are going to benefit from this aren't going to be able to pay for it, so why should we, we bother? The yellow fever vaccine has been the same since about 19, uh, since the 1930s, if I remember correctly. There's no incentive to try to, to improve that because uh, you know, yellow fever is predominantly happening uh, to people who are living in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of, of South America who don't have the financial resources for the pharmaceutical companies from an economic perspective to make it worth their while. So, I mean, going back to um, your discussion of um, the norms and the World Health Organization, I mean, do you think that that's one area in which um, there still needs to be a transition, like in terms of believing, you know, the, the, the WHO survived um, this last sort of crisis um, because enough people believed in it, but there still seems to be a lack of um, belief in, you know, producing vaccines and distributing them widely for the good of the whole 
planet like that we haven't reached that stage yet um yeah and, and also, it, it's also that ahead, interplay, uh, interplay between the world health organization and something like the world trade organization and the sorts of, of motivations that they have and the sorts of incentives that they have aren't necessarily aligned so it's you know you can have the same uh the same government in both organizations that is essentially almost arguing past itself or arguing uh, uh, positions that, that don't actually line up with each other. And within the World Trade Organization, there is a bit of a carve out for, um, for public health emergencies. There's the, uh, the, the TRIPS agreement and the, the Doha Declaration, both of which came out in the early part of the 21st century, um, largely in response to HIV AIDS and access to, to, um, to antiretroviral drugs. And those do give governments some ability to to um, to engage in the sorts of practices that would otherwise not be allowed. So um, violating patents in times of public health emergencies or importing drugs from other countries where they're being sold cheaper. So there is some of that power, but it's also really challenging for countries to exercise that power because of the fear, the fear that they have of retribution down the line. Maybe then that this this company this manufacturer is no longer going to be willing to uh, sell its products within our borders. Or maybe that, that the host country of that pharmaceutical manufacturer is going to then retaliate against us later. So again, those sorts of incentive structures that, that exist here aren't necessarily in, in alignment and there hasn't there hasn't necessarily been a good way to, to bring those organizations together. You know, when we think about global health governance, we're, we're kind of looking at just this narrow slice of global governance writ large. And, you know, in some respects, looking at, at the, the vaccine access is going to be this issue of global governance as opposed just to, to global health governance. And um, do you know, um, you said at the beginning, you know, quite rightly that we should be, um, uh, you know, amazed and happy about the development of the, the vaccines in such a short amount of time. And so, for example, the U.S. government put in a lot of money towards that. Um, mm. But as far as you know, there's no there were no conditions attached to that money saying, well, you have to now make this open access or it was just conditions about doses. So it wasn't right. Yep. Yeah. And there there's been some reporting that's come out recently that there were um that at least one of the the vaccines that has been in in um, has been in development that there was a push to try to make it open access essentially to try to make sure that it'd be widely available and that uh, one of the funders um, put put the, the kibosh on that said no like you need to you need to apply for patent rights you need to do to do all of the, these sorts of things you need to protect these these sorts of intellectual property rights so I, again, you've got that, that, that tension between the, the health imperatives and some of the economic imperatives that, that people are, are addressing. Even though, as you pointed out earlier, there's a serious financial cost, even to the countries in the global north, about not making these vaccines available in, in the global south. That this is going to have the, these sorts of knock-on effects. Um, but you know, a lot of our, our governance systems aren't well designed or uh, for thinking about about those sorts of secondary or tertiary effects of of the, these sorts of policies. Well, and just just to bring that really home to to both you and me and to our audience here, many of our audience here, um, you know, universities in Canada um, have a lot of international students now. You know, and it's a it's partly a financial um, model. Um, the same is true in the UK. Same is true in the US. Um, and that's one really clear example of like, well, we're, you know, if we, if we don't have, um, you know, a vaccination rollout across the whole world, then that may still be affected. And that directly affects us here in terms mm -hmm. of like, well, not only the students that can come here, but also the money that, you know, comes along with them, um, you know, and, you know, the lack of education that, you know, they'll have access to in terms of coming to Canada, you know, if they've chosen, that's what they want to do. So, yeah, I mean, we, we're in a business that, it, you know, it's very obvious that we're internationalized um, and that, you know, that's not going to stop. You know, globalization is not going into retreat. Um, so, Jeremy, I really want to thank you for um, that really enlightening discussion um, and the great overview. Um, and uh, before we move on to the Q&A, is there anything you want to say just in summation or are you are you kind of done? I, I am curious to hear what sorts of questions or comments um, our, our audience has. So I, I'm excited to hear what, what they've got. So again, um, we have to kind of applaud you virtually for the for this part of the talk. So um, 
you know, but thanks very much. That's been really enlightening and really has, um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like you said at the beginning, um, really reiter reiterated the fact that this is not just a biomedical problem. And in fact, can never be just seen as a biomedical problem that we need um, the social sciences and humanities to think about this, not just now, but going forward as well. Um, so I'm gonna hand over now um, to a colleague of mine uh, from sociology, who's gonna moderate um, the Q&A with Professor Yu. Um, so I'm gonna introduce uh, my colleague, um, Dr. Naomi Nichols there. Um, Naomi is the Canada Research Chair in Community, community Partnered Social Justice um, and a faculty member in sociology. Um, and so Dr. Nichols is gonna moderate this uh, Q&A um, with Jeremy, and then I'll see you um, everybody at the end, just to say thanks and wrap up. But thanks again, Jeremy, and I'll pass over to Naomi. Thank you so much, Momin, and thank you, Professor Yu. That was a really stimulating talk, um, evidenced by the interesting questions that are coming through in the Q&A. So for those of you who do have questions, don't feel shy. You can write them in the Q&A and then I will orally present them to Jeremy. I've tried to sort of cluster them a little bit. Okay. Um, one of the questions that I think is interesting in terms of the importance you placed at the beginning of the talk on establishing shared norms. Like none of this works if we don't have shared norms holding us all together. Some people are writing in questions about um, skeptics and conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers, um, anti-maskers, and people that are publicly and at great volume um, undermining some of also like the normative communication structures, public health messaging, um, expertise from epidemiologists. How do uh, local and global governing systems address what seems to be a growing issue in terms of um, people's uh, lack of faith in some of our, our, our normative structures through which we, we learn things or gather information? Yeah, that, that is such a tricky question because as you pointed out, you know, we are seeing these, you know, the anti-vaxxers, the anti-maskers, all of the, these sorts of uh, conspiracies that's, you know, it's 5G, it's Bill Gates, it's what it's the Chinese government was deliberately releasing this as part of some sort of, uh, uh, of plot. Um, and, I, you know, I think there are a few things that, that, that come into play. One does go back to this, this idea about the basic competency of institutions, that this is a long term process, that, that there is unlikely to be any single statement that a government could make or any single action that, that is just going to automatically change things and be like, oh, yes, completely. We, we've got this. We, we understand. Um, you know, there, there has to be that it, we have to show that these institutions are able to, to do what what they say they're doing and that they're living up to, to their, their expectations. Um, I think there's also a communications element of this. And there has to be a willingness on the part of, of policymakers and governments to you know, tell what they know, but also what they don't know, or to acknowledge when they make mistakes. Because you know, this is a brand new issue. None of us had ever heard of this disease until um, you know, it didn't even have a name at this, uh, you know, at, at this point um, a year ago. And so we're going to make mistakes. That's going to be inherent in, in the process. But if there is that willingness to engage in those, those sorts of conversations and say like, hey, okay, we thought X, actually now we, we understand it's Y and, and acknowledging that, that um, uh, you know, acknowledging that that, that sort of, of challenge that goes along with it goes a long way in helping to build that sense of trust. Like, okay, they, they you know, they, they kind of understand what, what, what's going on. And, and we have seen, you know, I think that's one of the, the ways in which uh, Jacinda Ardern and the New Zealand government really set a high bar for, for so many other governments and just coming out there and, you know, having those daily press conferences and making sure that people understood what was going on, what we know, what we don't know, here's what we're trying to, 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 to figure out. Um, and then I think that the third thing that really comes into play here in terms of trying to, to um, uh, challenge some of these, these, these skeptics or trying to um, counteract some of these um, messages that, that are coming out is to recognize that there's real pain that goes along with some of these measures that have been put into place. You know, the fact that, that, that restaurants uh, can't be open, the fact that people are, have, are seeing their incomes uh, diminished if they're not completely losing their jobs, the fact that it's just, it's really hard not to be able to go places or to have to think about, uh, about um, you know, just 
you know, all the, the sorts of things that we took for granted in the, the before times, we can't really do in the, the same sort of way. And so that gets to also, you know, I think some of, of what we see goes beyond just the, you know, I don't believe in, in science. It also comes to like the, the sorts of things that you are putting in place have real costs for me, psychic costs, mental costs, economic costs. And we need to make sure that, that those are also being addressed. And, and again, it kind of goes to the fact that the, these problems are beyond biomedical problems. They're also social problems. And so if we don't see uh, institutions that are responding on all of these different levels, or at least acknowledging um, all, all these different levels, that's going to be really hard for people to, th to think that those institutions are actually working in their best interest. Totally. And that actually speaks directly to another group of questions that came in that were about very specific measures that have been imposed locally here in Canada and different provinces and also globally. And the the ways they might disproportionately pain particular groups or, or target particular groups and um, the ways they've sort of protected perhaps other interests um, at the expense of, of the less powerful. So questions if this is okay, I'll sort of try to group them. Questions about um, the disproportionate harms faced by small businesses, and then those who rely on those small businesses for access to healthcare in the U.S., for example, versus the, you know, we, we know that a lot of spread is happening in um, larger scale, like food processing plants and areas like this, but those places haven't been shut down in many instances. They've been deemed essential. And so, the, you know, the government's responsibility to weigh those different interests and the disproportionate, the degree to which different parts of the, sec of the population have been disproportionately burdened by particular measures. Um, and then one other question that's a, about measures in particular about in Quebec, we have a curfew that's been imposed. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the degree again to which a measure like that um, unfairly and disproportionately impacts those who spend more time on the streets for lack of access to safe and adequate housing or because they're engaged in sex work or because they are um, using drugs and that's where they can get them. Um, so those, those, those two types of measures. Yeah, and the, the, you know, the, there is all of this inconsistency in the sorts of policies that, that, that governments have been putting into place um, you know, across the board. You know, as you, you spoke about um, things like packing plants, you know, here in Minnesota, one of the biggest outbreaks that we had was in a, a, a meat processing plant. Um, and that also then had the additional complication put on top of it in that a lot of those workers um, were were undocumented. And so you've got an additional sort of, of, of potential legal issue or, or groups that, that might feel, um, feel un, uh, cautious at, at best in terms of trying to approach, uh, you know, for, for some sort of relief because they, they might fear that there'd be some sort of, of knock on effect to, to, to them. Um, to, to some degree, I think the inconsistency is going to happen, uh, is going to happen regardless. Like, you know, the, but it is hard to, to explain like, okay, so why does my gym gets to open at 25 capacity, 25% capacity, but this church gets to open at 50% at capacity, but this restaurant can do it at, if you're doing indoor dining, but not outdoor, you know, all of the, the, these different sorts of things. And, you know, part of that, I think again, goes to, to the sorts of, of, of conversations, but also recognize that, that, that policymakers are having but also recognizing that these are, in many ways, political decisions and the sorts of lobbying that uh, efforts that are are taking place. And so it's you know it's unlikely that that we're going to get um, a one size fits all. Everything has to close at a certain time, or everything's going to be at twenty five percent. But I think more fundamentally, it also speaks to the fact that we've probably misprioritized what we are mm -hmm. focusing on. You know, one of the, the the things that has really come out here in the States is we seem to have put more emphasis on when can we reopen restaurants and bars as opposed to when can we reopen K-12 schools. Um, and, you know, a part of that's going into um, a, a access to the, the sorts of, of halls of power. You know, kindergartners don't have the same sort of lobbying power that the uh, Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association might have or that the, the restaurant industry might have. But they're all, you know, governments are also thinking about their own bottom lines in, in some respects. You know, the in, in the US, uh, I believe with in, in all 50 states, those states have to present a balanced budget. 
um, they cannot go into deficit spending. The federal government can, but the state governments can't. And so if they're closing down uh, restaurants, bars, businesses, and these sorts of things, that has a direct effect on their, their ability to then fund those schools or to do th those other sorts of things. And so you know, it kind of gets to, to, to some of, of these sorts of issues in a way that's not really, there's no great way to, to try to, 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 to satisfy. Um, but I think that the, this element of, of the, the disproportionate harm to different groups, especially because of, of the various curfews that have, have existed um, and the various policies that have been put into place, um, you know, it, again, it speaks to, to some of the lack of social services that, that we have in a lot of places and the need to, to try to um, a, a, you know, address the, these uh, these issues in a non-judgmental way to make services available um, for for people, but even more importantly, is recognizing that that part of what seems to be successful, or part of where we tend, have tended to see some success, has been less about imposing laws and fining people for being out after curfew or doing things like that, and more about creating these sorts of social norming uh, campaigns. And so it becomes something that that we do as uh, as part of a group. We're doing this because we're trying to take care of ourselves. We're trying to take care of, of each other. Um, and there's been some research that's just starting to come out that has looked at some of this communication and governments, again, that have had, or national governments that have had some of these more effective responses have really emphasized, like, this is a relay race. We are all part of the, this long relay. And so this is why we're taking these measures. And this is why we all have, have a role to play. And that those sorts of strategies have not only been more effective than punitive uh, laws, but have also been more effective than some of the military metaphors that were going to war with, 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 uh, with COVID or things like this, that it, it can help to build that, that sense of, of social responsibility. And I think part of that social responsibility also means recognizing that not everyone is leading the a middle class lifestyle where they're going to, to go home to their their you know to their their their, their nice home and live that, that sort of comfortable lifestyle um, at eight o'clock or 10 p.m. whenever the, the those curfews go into power. And that those people who may be experiencing um, homelessness or engaging in um, drug activities or sex work, whatever they're doing, they are also part of that community. They are also part of that, that relay. And if we ignore those groups, which are even more vulnerable than, than say the comfortable middle-class uh, person that, that I am, we're going to get, continue to be at risk. And we also risk creating a further bifurcation within society in which um, groups that are already marginalized become even more marginalized or become uh, stigmatized. You're the reason that, that, that we can't get this pandemic under control. We would be okay, but you're staying out too late. You're engaged in, in sex work or, or doing the, these sorts of things. And so I think a lot of it um, gets to, again, th these sorts of norms and this, this sense of like, this is, this is a shared sacrifice, but it's also something that we can't put wholly on the, the shoulders of individuals. We have to recognize that there is a role for society to play, for governments to play. And it's including all the groups, not just the groups that happen to be the most loud or have the most access to uh, policymakers. It is hard to do this because there are so many good questions here and I'm sure everyone- could be here for hours, I'm yes, sure. And they passionately want them addressed, um, but we are already over time. So we'll oh work goodness. on a couple more. Okay. Um, one that came out in two places, uh, Dr. Buccieri's class actually prepared some questions in advance and it showed up there. And then another um, participant in the audience also raised it about the um, potential public health implications of the measures in terms of other health outcomes, in particular mental health outcomes um, for young people, young people who've lost their um, access to socializing institutions like schools um, at a time in their development when that access is really important to their well-being and um, the kind of person that they're going to be. So just a, a, a comment there from you would be lovely. Yeah, it's, you know, there, there was, um, something that a friend posted on, on Facebook um, the other day and was like, you know, I haven't been able to hug someone in a year. Like that has huge ramifications for, for our, you know, just you know, our physical or social or mental, mental health. Um, and you know, th this is, is, is a very important element in, you know, looking at it in terms of mental health, but also in terms of physical health, because one thing that we have seen in a lot of, of disease outbreaks in general is that um, the, the death rates from other issues are also going up. So something that, that we saw, for instance, um, during Ebola and Zika 
is that complications from pregnancies were going up and the rates of maternal death were going up, not because uh, there was something that was changing um, physically with, with um, any of the, the, the uh, women giving birth, but because healthcare systems were overwhelmed or because people were like, you know what, I don't want to go to the hospital because I'm afraid if I go to the hospital, then I might contract uh, th this disease that all these other people um, are there, they're dealing with. And that doesn't even get to, to, to some of the, of the mental health issues. Um, and so it, it does call on us to, to, to think about the, these sorts of responses in a very comprehensive manner and to recognize that even in the midst of, of an outbreak, even in the midst of a, of a pandemic, other health concerns don't go away. People still are going to have heart attacks. People are still going to, to have issues with depression and need to make sure that they, um, they can seek treatment. Uh, and I know that, that many, um, many of the, the, the mental health organizations um, around the world have gone above and beyond trying to find ways to adapt their services to make sure that, hey, maybe we can't see each other in person, but let's set up a telehealth appointment so that we can still make sure that you get some sort of, of uh, that you have access to therapy, or you make sure that your medicines are still being updated or, or, or doing these sorts of things. Um, but you know, thinking about about the mental health of of young people, that's one of the issues that that I imagine is happening at Trent. It's happening here at University of Minnesota Duluth. We're constantly trying to figure out like how do we make sure that these these students who come to us feel like they have a stake here and feel like they are being seen and that that, that they are able to to access those sorts of services. I don't know that anyone anyone has found a great answer to that, um, and it's going to be one of those things where you. You're, you're throwing a lot of different things at the wall because different things are going to work for different people. There's not going to be a one size fits all um, solution to it, but it is important to make sure that, that we do keep, um, keep those elements in mind as we're thinking about the, these sorts of responses and not just think, okay, um, you know, everything needs to be, be COVID related. We need to have public health systems that are broadly resilient and can uh, you know, adapt to whatever the outbreak is, but also then still have the, the sorts of abilities or the sorts of resources so they, they can address the other sorts of issues that people are going to face just by virtue of, of their, their own life cycles. Wow, um, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the questions they're pouring in. Um, and they're so interesting and important. I'm trying to like weigh what we do with the last 10 minutes of being over time. Um, one question that I think, so we've just talked about youth um, and how the, the types of struggles that are particular to their developmental life stage um, that, that, that might be coming into view for us right now. But another question is about elderly people and especially, um, well, not necessarily just elderly people, but those who are in our long-term care facilities who tend um, to disproportionately be elderly, but are not always. Um, and there's a question here I actually think I need to read out because it's quite long. So the ED of the Ontario Healthcare Coalition has recently made it known how the Ontario government has during the second wave of COVID-19 indemnified long-term care homes against mm -hmm. negligence, refused military support as we, that, that was actually put in place in the spring that they needed military support um, and which made public the shocking dismissal conditions in LTC. So it was the military that came in and sort of said, oh my God, it's a disaster in there. And then further deregulated long-term care regarding creating a group of workers to work in long-term care facilities, but that do not have their qualifications to bathe and clean residents, for example. So to comment again on um, the care crisis in, that is particular to the folks who are dependent on others for care in our long-term care facilities during COVID and any information you might have on discussions at the transnational level, um, read this problem. Is this a problem faced by other nation states? And if so, how are they addressing it or, or not? Yeah, it, th this is something that, that, that we've seen pretty broadly in terms of, you know, especially for those uh, individuals who are in long term care facilities, be they elderly um, or, or, or not. And, you know, there you've got a few different impulses that, that are, are going on there. One is coming out of kind of this libertarian populist sort of ethos of, you know what, hey, we need to we need to indemnify these businesses because we need you know, we don't want uh, we we don't want them to be going out of business or to, to be re refusing care to people because they're afraid that they're going to, to get sued. Um, then you've also got this, this sort of all hands on deck response, like, oh my goodness, we need people who can come in and, and do these sorts of things. Um, you know, to, to, to the former, I, 
it, that that's just a, a a baffling sort of response to me in, in a lot of ways, and that's something that that we've seen um, here in the states. And it's actually become a, a big partisan issue that you know this could be a trading chip. Like, okay, if you'll indemnify these businesses, then we'll provide additional funding for for COVID relief or or, or something along those lines. And you know, I don't that that doesn't really get to the the underlying issue that that is at, at, at play. And uh, it, it's it also tends to neglect the actual people who are getting this care and the, the sorts of experiences that, that, that they are having. Um, and, you know, it's, this is a time when it's, what we don't want to do is just kind of throw open the, 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 the gates and be like, all right, do whatever you want. And then we'll figure it out afterwards. This is actually time to, to have, you know, have those engaged sorts of conversations to figure out, okay, so what is the actual, you know, what's driving this? What is the actual fear that, that, that you as a, as a business association have? And how can we try to address that while still making sure that, that there is going to be adequate care? Um, for, for, the, uh, for, for the latter and the, the sorts of all hands on deck approach, on the one hand, you know, there's, there's something to be said for it. You know, you want it, you, you need to have, have people there. But again, it's not about just throwing things open. It's about trying to figure out, are there ways that we can try to um, get people up to speed in a relatively quick manner or try to change some of the, the ways that we are providing care to folks so that we can maybe um, have a one group that is taking care of be, uh, helping people to move and one group that is, be, that is able to focus on people um, who can bathe those, those individuals in long care term care facilities and others who can provide more of the skilled nursing. Is there a way that we can try to break up some of these tasks so that we can get people into to, to those, um, those, those positions with you know, adequate training, but perhaps on an accelerated schedule than, than we might otherwise do. You know, we're unlikely to be able to train someone to become a registered nurse in a, a very compressed time period. That is something that, that takes a, 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 an amount of time uh, to get those skills. And we want those people to have those skills because we are entrusting them with our health or with the health of our, our loved ones. But there might be other ways to try to structure those, those, um, those sorts of positions in order to, um, to facilitate bringing people on board in a way that is still going to, to um, both respect the, the health needs of those individuals, but also respect their, their, their underlying dignity and, and their own privacy concerns, because that has also then sometimes become an issue if you just suddenly throw people into um, long-term care facilities. You know, those people are, are oftentimes quite vulnerable and we don't want to inadvertently expose those people to a greater vulnerability from, from harm or harassment or abuse while we're saying that we're trying to protect them from COVID. Wonderful. And uh, you're doing a very good job of scaling sort of to the individual level and then to the you know, organizational, municipal, provincial. Um, I wanna go back to the transnational level and there's mm -hmm. been a bunch of colleagues um, in sociology and, and students who are writing in about ec political economic issues. Um, and I, I'm trying to figure out how to make it one question because it's really like five. <laughs> but uh, one is about the estimated costs of the pandemic. And, and related to that, like, what would be a who, who should bear those costs? And if it's the WHO, what would be um, that bear some of them, what would be like a, a budget that would be reasonable for a massive organization that has, serves uh, a global mandate like the WHO um, would be like a part A. We'll okay. just answer that one first and then okay. I'll do a part B to make it not so complicated. It, it's, you know, part of the problem that, that something like WHO has is because of the way it's it's funded, as opposed to even just the amount of funding that it has. Mm -hmm. So WHO's funding comes largely from member states. You know, it gets some from from other um, organizations, like you know, the Gates Foundation is a big funder, but you know, only about twenty percent of its budget comes from member dues. Um, you know, each country has to pay a certain amount to to be a member on an annual basis. And that money, WHO gets to choose what they wanted, want to do with it. They, want, they can make up their, their budget entirely. The other 80% comes from voluntary contributions. And th that's great. You know, it's great to have the, those sorts of voluntary contributions. It's, in some respects, it's a sign of faith in the, the World Health Organization, um, recognizing that, hey, if we're going to try to deal with polio eradication, instead of having you know, individual governments doing this, let's work through, through these other sorts of structures. But the problem is that those those voluntary contributions almost always come with, come attached to a specific project 
we will give you $5 million for malaria. We will give you $10 million to do this sort of thing. And so the WHO doesn't have the flexibility to, to reorient funds at a time when it really needs to be able to do that. So instead it has to go hat in hand out to these countries and be like, hey, we need some additional resources in order to affect a, um, a, a, a valid and, a, and an appropriate response, which means that's going to take a while for that money to come in, which means that the, the outbreak is going to, to get that much um, more intense in, 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 in the process. And we saw this actually, one of the clearest examples of this was um, shortly before the Ebola outbreak happened in West Africa, the WHO had to cut its budget for pandemic preparedness by 50% because of how the, the money was coming in and where they could actually allocate the, those, those funds. And so in some respects, it's not even so much the raw amount of money, um, though uh, you know, $5 billion over a two-year period is not going to be sufficient to deal with, with, with COVID, be it through you know, national governments, the WHO, anything like that. But the fact that you've got such constraints on those those $5 billion and where they can be spent just makes it that much worse of, of a problem for an organization like, like WHO. So yes, to, 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 to more money, but um, also to restructuring how that money comes in and, and how um, WHO is empowered to, to figure out how to spend that money. Well, that was another that relates to the part B, which is that, you know, in other parts of our global governance system, um, global governance organizations like the IMF, the IMF or the WTO or the World Bank do have powers um, to structurally impose things upon um, sovereign nation states and do have discretionary powers in a different way in terms of their spending and prioritization. Yep. And um, to what extent are some of the struggles um, that we're, we're seeing in terms of the, 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 the power of the WHO to actually address um, the issue directly um, re relating to like an, uh, another underlying ethos, another normative set of values around capitalism and um, markets and uh, in individual sovereignty, nation state sovereignty, but only in relation to certain pieces, like not money. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, the, the, there are very clear divides between the powers that something like the WHO has versus, say, the WTO. You know, you don't have the, the same sort. It, the World Health Organization cannot impose fines against states. So there is this tre treaty that's called the International Health Regulations. Um, you may remember about this time last year, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern for COVID-19. Um, that's something that comes out of the international health regulations. It regulates how countries are supposed to respond to infectious disease outbreaks, how they're supposed to report that information to WHO and share it more, more broadly. Um, and mandates that there are supposed to be certain surveillance systems that, that are set up in place so we can try to identify outbreaks early um, before, they, they get, uh, th before they spread too far. But Again, you know, there's no power to find states um, if they, they violate this. You know, all the states that have signed on to it, um, but like I said, no power to, to, um, to find states that do it. They can't put governments into country jail um, for it. Um, they, they, they can't kick countries out of, of the WHO. Um, you know, their, their power is essentially one of naming and shaming. Um, and that, you know, we, we've seen some elements where that's worked really well. Um, you know, we, we see some... Uh, um, you know, if you look at the, the response to SARS, um, you know, naming and shaming was, was kind of effective in that regards. And that actually happened before the international health regulations were, were in power. Um, but, you know, the, all of these mandates also came with no funding. So, hey, you have to set up the surveillance system to identify these infectious disease outbreaks before um, they, they spread too far. That's really important. That's really powerful. But for a lot of countries, if you've got a limited budget for your, your public health system, Okay, you know that it becomes sort of a zero sum game. Whether if we are spending money on on the surveillance system, what are we not able to to spend money on? And a lot of that comes down to the sorts of negotiations that we had within um, the World Health Organization and within global health governance writ large about what sorts of ways um, we as an international system want to empower global health governance and want to empower the World Health Organization. You know, it was a choice to give the World Trade Organization that power to actually um, affect sanctions and to, to impose those sorts of sanctions on, on governments. It was a choice not to give those, those uh, sorts of, of powers to the World Health Organization. Um, doesn't mean that we can't do that or that, that we couldn't do that. 
you know, the question is, is about the, the political terrain in which those sorts of negotiations would take place. And you know, one thing that, that I think it would be very you know, crucial for empowering the World Health Organization or giving it more of the, those strengths, you know, we need a few countries to take ownership of this issue, to show leadership um, and saying like, this is something we consider important. We have seen what happens when we don't have, the, have these, these powers. We need to, to, to look at what other sorts of, of powers might, might exist. You know, traditionally in, in these sorts of negotiations, we might look to those so-called middle powers. So the Canada's, the Germany's, the, the Australia's, the countries that aren't the most powerful, but have kind of the, like the, you know, the good citizen re reputation um, within the international system. But it's also going to be very important if we do have anything like that, that we also have countries from the global south that, that are part of that. Because you know, it's one thing to say, hey, you need to set up um, the, the surveillance system. We're going to set up um, this power to sanction countries that don't, um, that don't do it. It's another thing to, to have the countries that aren't able to do it be like, whoa, wait a second. Now this organization is coming after me and you're not giving me um, the, the funding, I'm getting this mandate from the global north that is, is, is keeping me down. Why am I going to report the, these outbreaks? Or why am I even going to, to engage with the, this organization? So it's a very tricky sort of, of, of politics. Um, and when they, they negotiated the current international health regulations, there were some efforts initially to try to get some more power for the WHO and those politically became non-starters. Doesn't mean that, that we couldn't revisit those. Um, you know, and, and I think in the aftermath of, of COVID, coming on the aftermath of Zika and coming on the aftermath of Ebola and all the, these sorts of, of, of uh, issues that we've seen over the past decade, there may be some willingness to look at it. But again, it's not just going to happen organically. There needs to be some sort of leadership. Someone needs to, to be willing to, to take this up, to be that norm entrepreneur, to push for this and to, to really champion the cause. Thank you so much. I. Uh... Feel like there's so many things that I heard today that are also applicable to other um, global political issues at this time that we're facing and it's been really really informative. I apologize to the people who did post questions that we didn't get to address and thank you very much for sharing them. I will try to make sure that I at least pass them on to Dr. Yud so that he has them and, and knows of your interest in your high level of engagement and I am passing the baton over to Momin now to say goodbye. Thanks uh, very much, Naomi. So thanks to Dr. Nichols for hosting that Q&A. Um, and uh, again, apologies um, that we didn't get to all of the questions. There are still, I think, 19 questions there. Um, but it, I think it's a great illustration of how um, impactful the talk has been. Um, and before we wrap up, I just want to reiterate our thanks to uh, Bruce Kennedy, our donor, also to the Department of Sociology, um, who hosted this, and also to our college at Trent Otonaby College, which also provided lots of support, and to the team at um, Communications um, who helped us put this together. Um, most of all, I want to thank the audience for joining us um, and making it such a successful inaugural lecture. And of course, above everything else, um, before we say goodbye, I want to say a really huge thanks to um, Professor Yud for such a stimulating discussion and a timely discussion, and you know, really making us think differently. Um, and in a much more complex way about um, this moment um, that we're living through um, that isn't going to end anytime soon. But I'm hoping that um, that discussion has really um, yeah, helped us to think through some of those um, complex issues. And really, Jeremy, I want to um, I, I love the way that, you know, you've really demonstrated to to the audience here that um, not only are problems complex, but also we need, you know, politics and sociology and humanities and social sciences to work through, um, you know, the stuff of life that we're dealing with, particularly when we have, um, you know, something that appears at first off, you know, a kind of medical issue. So I think that really came across strongly. So again, um, thanks very much um, to Professor Jeremy Ude for the talk today. And thanks to you for joining. And uh, we're going to stop recording now and sign off. So thank you, everybody. Thank you all so much. <laughs>